Welcome everybody to today's Consortium of Universities for Global Health's webinar. Today's webinar is on human health and ocean pollution, addressing the urgent crisis to save the planet, oceans, and ourselves. We know that oceans cover some 70% of the world's Earth's of our planet's surface. It's a foundation for all life on our planet. Yet, we have been using it as a dumping ground and to lethal consequences. The polluting of our oceans affects all life on Earth, including our own. We know that COVID-19 is a massive issue affecting the planet, but there are many other global health challenges that are before us and some are deeply neglected, and this is one of them. I'm very pleased today that, to, that this particular webinar will actually relate to a recently published uh, report, a seminal report, on uh, ocean pollution, and it was done by Boston College and the Center Scientific de Monaco. It is right here, a special edition of the Annals of Global Health that you can look at it online. I encourage you to please do that. And we're very lucky today to have three of the outstanding contributors to that document, leaders of that report that came out. The speakers today, in their order, will be first Dr. Laura Fleming. Dr. Fleming is the chair and director of the European Center for Environment and Human Health at the University of Exeter in the United Kingdom. And Dr. Fleming will be followed by Dr. John Stegeman. Dr. Stegeman is the director and senior scientist at the Woods Hole Center for Oceans and Human Health at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And finally, Dr. Phil Landrigan. Dr. Landrigan is one of the key authors of the report He's also the director of the Program for Global Public uh, Health, the director of the Global Observatory on Pollution and Health at Boston College. So we're in for a real treat today. I'm gonna to turn it over to first to uh, Dr. Fleming. Get your questions and answers ready and please submit them into the chat box, the question box uh, on the computer, and we'll get to as many of them at the end of the, the presentations today. So Dr. Fleming, welcome, and I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Martin, and my thanks to the consortium for arranging this opportunity. So I'm going to give a brief overview of the larger context of ocean and human health. I will talk also a little bit about ocean and human health and how it's both risks and benefits. I'll give you a few short project examples and next steps. So many of you have already been acquainted with Rockstrom's um, planetary boundaries and how, from an environmental point of view, we have reached many of these planetary boundaries already. I also note Kate Rawworth's work where she has tried to situate our human boundaries within these planetary boundaries. And again, the number of them are being reached. And then I think the larger um, framework potentially for ocean and human health is planetary health. But in particular, I think ocean and human health actually links to all of the sustainable development goals because in order to really reach the sustainable development goals, we must take care of both the health of the ocean and the environment and human health. So ultimately what ocean and human health is, is a healthy ocean is good for human health and well-being. Um, in addition to these interconnections and interdependencies, it also implies a large a complexity of science, the necessity for inter and transdisciplinary, trans-institutional and trans-sector approaches not just talking about the risks, but also the benefits and opportunities for both the health of the ocean and of humans. And given the current COVID-19 situation and the fact that we're about to start UN decades in both ocean and ecosystem restoration, I think the time is now to really take the agenda of ocean and human health forward. Ocean and human health was first conceived as a meta-discipline, I would argue, by the United States, by the National Academy of Science, with the publication of From Monsoons to Microbes in 1999, and there have been a slew of reports since then. And in Europe, it was really 2013, 2014, when the European Marine Board produced a white paper linking ocean and human health. I also want to um, highlight the ocean literacy um, movement, which is both on both sides of the Atlantic, but also around the world. And I particularly want to um, highlight the fact that the ocean literacy movement is now moving towards the idea that community involvement, engagement, co-creation are essential if we're going to improve the situation of both our health and the ocean health. And finally, just in setting out this stage, I want to just highlight the fact that the ocean literacy movement has produced an idea of a global, single global ocean. 
but many um, environmental people, particularly marine scientists and ecologists, prefer to still use the, the concept of oceans. I will use both. So traditionally, if I can talk about tradition, ocean, and human health, people have focused on the risks to human health. And the big, huge risk, the 10-ton gorilla, is climate change and all of the ramifications of climate change, including extreme weather, sea level rise, and potentially ocean acidification. But we also need to think about harmful algal blooms and their toxins, fisheries destruction, microbial pollution, antimicrobial resistance, and of course, man-made chemicals, including plastics. And the report that you will be hearing about from my colleagues, Dr. Stegeman and, and Landergan, will discuss a lot more detail those issues. One of the things that I think that Europe has brought to the table around ocean human health and its conception is the idea that benefits, innovation, opportunities are equally important. And so we know there's a lot of data out there that good quality seafood is important not only as a protein source, but because of micronutrients able to protect and prevent the onset of certain chronic diseases. A huge amount of modeling, forecasting, and technology has gone into monitoring the oceans and has led to early warning systems such as hurricane warnings. The marine biodiversity has allowed us to already to develop certain drugs such as chemotherapy um, agents and has much promise for the future. And of course, there's considerable um, work going on in creating uh, renewable energy sources. And finally, as particularly over the last 10 years, there's been an explosion of evidence demonstrating that if people can be exposed to high quality marine and other blue environments, it is good in terms of prevention and treatment for our physical health and um, mental well-being. So I'm now going to talk very briefly about a few projects that may be of interest, which demonstrate how broad this area is, but also that it's not just geographically specific. So the Blue Health Project, funded by European Horizon 2020 funding, had spent five years, very interdisciplinary, and it looked at how, what is the evidence for um, interactions with blue environments in terms of our health and well-being. And it produced tools and publications and evidence, and it is worth looking at. Another ongoing project is funded by UK funding, GCRF funding, called the Blue Communities Project. It takes place in four Southeast Asian partner countries. They are based in um, the marine protected areas and UNESCO biospheres in those countries. And it looks at how, whether or not marine spatial planning can help increase um, the health and well being and food security of the populations of people living in and around these biospheres. And it also emphasizes co creations with these communities. And then finally, I just want to flag the Seas, Oceans, and Public Health in Europe or SOFI project, also funded by Horizon 2020, which was tasked on in creating a strategic research agenda in oceans and human health. It involved a consultation process with many different people, I'll, I'll, particularly because of this audience. I will highlight medical and public health people because they until recently are not at the table around ocean health. And it also gathered a lot of evidence. And it produced a strategic research agenda which emphasized three major areas where there could be um, funding and uh, activities going forward. So marine biodiversity, biotechnology and medicine, sustainable seafood and healthy people, blue spaces and tourism well-being. And their conclusions were that more funding is needed in this area. It needs to be international and interdisciplinary, but it will only work if the medical, public health, marine and environmental science communities work together. They need not only to work together to do research, but also produce transdisciplinary training for the next generation and co-create and engage with diverse communities, particularly affected communities. So I think the big issue for all of us who are involved in environment and health, and also particularly in ocean human health, is how do we make people care? And I'm gonna give you a couple of very brief examples of some ongoing work around the world of really interesting ways of interacting in positive ways for both the human health and the ocean health. So the first example is it takes place or is currently taking place in Catalonia in a small town called Rosas, which shares a peninsula with a marine protected area called Cap de Crius. And with the University of Gerona, they have formed something they call the Chair of Ocean and Human Health led by Dr. Josep Pioret. And they're doing really interesting, very collaborative, co-created work around what it means to live sustainably 
on the ocean coast now and into the future. I want to highlight also the Blue Climate Initiative, which is looking for big, innovative ideas in terms of addressing ocean-related climate change. And we'll soon be rolling out um, a Blue Communities in Action project um, in which Blue Communities will, will hopefully, around the world, different si sizes and abilities, share resources, training, and data. And I also want to highlight that I think it's really important for all of us that we involve youth as much as possible in our actions going forward. And they're already organizing and they will be inheriting the world that we're leaving them. Um, my next to final example is to think about the whole issue of healthcare writ large. And I've been working with some really interesting GPs in the, and anesthesiologists in the UK. And what they're pointing out is the impact of healthcare writ large and small on our environment, particularly the ocean. And there's the whole issue of transport, but also um, potentially oil spills and of course, plastic pollution with COVID. And one of the things they've pointed out is that 60% of the UK National Health Service CO2 emissions is from their supply train and 80% of that comes from container ships. At the same time, they're also emphasizing the idea that because we have this evidence now that interacting with blue environments and green environments be good for our health and well-being, that healthcare providers can interact sustainably with natural environments and their patients to make their lives better. And they're calling this NHS Ocean, and hopefully it's a movement that will spread around the world. And my last example is the fact that we are about to enter a UN Ocean Decade which is the science we need for the, for the ocean we want. And they are calling for actions of all different sizes. And I would love to imagine an ocean and human health action, particularly around marine protected areas, expanding them, interacting with the populations that live in and around them for the idea of human health and ocean well-being. My last slide, or next to last slide, is um, we did an IOC webinar on uh, oceans and human health, and we asked people for one word about what ocean health means to you. And this slide always inspires me because the central word that people came up with is life. Thank you very much for this, and I look forward to further interactions, and I'll now pass it over to Dr. John Stegeman. Thank you very much, Laura, for that uh, wonderful and comprehensive introduction to oceans and human health. And I would also like to thank very much uh, Phil Landrigan and the and uh, Keith Martin for the opportunity to talk today in this very important webinar. And I'd like to thank the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences and the National Science Foundation for their support of the Woods Hole Center for Oceans and Human Health. So what you've heard from Laura Fleming is, uh, is the global ocean balance with uh, benefits and risks, both physical and also uh, nutritional and other health benefits. What you'll hear now is the flip side of that, and that is something about the chemical and biological risks. And the topics I'll address briefly are hazard sources, exposure, some outcomes, what we need to know, and why I think we can be optimistic. So as Laura alluded to, there are multiple and diverse hazards, and I'm going to focus only on those chemical and biological hazards, including persistent organic pollutants, mercury, pesticides, pharmaceutical waste, plastics, harmful algal bloom, toxins, and so on. All of these have primarily land-based sources, the pops, many and varied, mercury from coal burning and gold extraction, pesticides and pharma waste from agricultural and urban waste, plastics, many sources. Petroleum is natural from seeps, but also spills and ships. And the HAB toxins, harmful algal bloom toxins, those are natural products and so on. And there also are recent unexpected high level sources that are being found. For example, up to 1500 tons of DDT found dumped off the California coast. And I uh, urge you to uh, participate in a webinar tomorrow, December 10th at 7 p.m. EST, in which David Valentine, who discovered this, will uh, discuss his findings. 
And there is a submarine that sank off the coast of Norway during World War II that has 67 tons of mercury, the largest single source of mercury in the oceans. And likely there are more surprises like this. So how many chemicals are there? Well, we really don't know, and there is just now beginning to be an effort to really gain a, a handle on just what is out there. And the first comprehensive analysis was done, published this year, 2020, and they identified 350,000 chemicals and mixtures that were registered for use in those places where they could get information, but not everywhere. Many of the mixtures contain publicly unknown uh, content, and so it, it is a problem that we don't know fully. But generally speaking, the planet is chemically different today than it was 100 years ago, and there are thousands of tons of known pollutants in the environment. Many have very long half-lives in the environment and in humans, for example, up to 47 years estimated for one PCB congener in humans, therefore persistent organic pollutants. In the Stockholm Convention, there are about 29 POPs identified. Actually, there are quite a few more because PCBs is listed as one, but there really are 207 different congeners, different chemicals, and the POPs all have differing toxicities and mechanisms. So where are these chemicals? Well, they're everywhere. They're in you and me, and they're all around the world. The currents in ocean and atmosphere transport these things along the coast to the poles, north and south, and to the deepest parts of the deep sea. But as far as human exposure, dietary, respiratory, dermal, ocular, but principally dietary for most of those we're concerned with. And this is a problem because an estimated one to three billion people rely on seafood for protein. The common dietary sources of POPs, mercury, and HAB toxins, shellfish, fish, meat and milk, and uh, marine mammals where they are harvested culturally. And 80, up to 80% of POPs exposure is estimated to be from seafood. So the transfer from ocean to adults, children, and infants can be through fish, but also through meat and milk, as a third of the world fish catch is used for animal feed into adults, but also exposure in utero and exposure via milk to infants. This is true for HAB toxins as well. Many of the HAB toxins are accumulated through the diet, although there is some respiratory exposure, but generally in shellfish and fish, and it's usually thought of as an adult problem, but there may be exposure in utero as well and unknown exposure in milk. Recent studies have shown that the bloom events are increasing and the geographic range of blooms is increasing, representing a growing problem. So what are the health concerns of contaminants? And I'm not going to deal with all of the risks nor all of the hazards, but known effects from animal and epi studies include neurodevelopmental effects, cardiovascular, immune suppression, endocrine and reproductive disruption, metabolic disease, and also transgenerational effects. These are principally from epi excuse me, from animal studies, but they are there. And they all fit into the developmental origins of health and disease concept. So some selected concerns, the neurodevelopmental effects, behavioral and cognitive impairment that may begin in utero and will persist into adulthood with global effects on IQ cardiovascular effects, heart development and adult cardiovascular disease, immune suppression, susceptibility to viral infections, which may include SARS-CoV-2. So there are strong studies, including prospective cohort studies that are showing such results. So Philippe Grandjean and Phil Landrigan summarized their findings in uh, analyzing the literature and find that many of the chemicals contribute to neurobehavioral effects during development. Their conclusion was that this is a global pandemic. And for cardiovascular disease, a study in Sweden of adults showed that higher levels of the highly chlorinated PCBs were associated with, back, with uh, 
mortality risk and cardiovascular disease in older adults. Now these were background levels of PCBs, not some special exposure. So what we're dealing with is the balance that you heard Dr. Fleming mention, the negative and the positive. So we have on the left, the synthetic chemicals, toxins, personal care drugs, plastics, et cetera, and those positive benefits on the right-hand side. And they both, from both directions, can influence health outcomes. But if we look at the, at the, at the risks, it is an exposure soup. No one is exposed to one chemical or one pathogen alone, but rather to all of them. And so if we look at this in the context of one outcome, for example, neurodevelopmental outcomes, synthetic chemicals, algal toxins, nanoplastics, mercury and drugs, all can contribute to neurodevelopmental outcomes, adverse outcomes. And if we bore down into synthetic chemicals, well, PCBs, DDT, mercury, PAHs, et cetera, they all can contribute to neurodevelopmental outcomes. So it's really a matter of shifting the balance. We need to shift the balance from the risks to the benefits. And I recommend a National Academy report on seafood choices that goes into this in some detail. So something about health concerns. The molecular mechanisms that contribute to disease by chemicals are common in humans and vertebrates and adverse outcomes may affect resource species. So this is part of one health. Exposures can alter drug metabolism in humans, affecting enzymes, receptors, and transporters, and so on. And animal models, in particular zebrafish, are pointing to cellular and molecular mechanisms and novel outcomes. And I list here four papers from our group that include things on nanoplastics, and also early myelination defects in, in, uh, with HAB toxins. Um, so what do we need to know? Well, we need to establish the effects of these mixtures of everything. We need to further confirm a marine source in many of the health outcomes. Certainly seafood is a major source of the contaminant and it is so likely that they are a source of adverse health effects but confirmation is needed. Human health effects of nano and microplastics, how might exposures change with changing seas and oceans, and where are the health impacts likely to be greatest? Indigenous peoples, global south, subsistence fishers, and how do we protect those most vulnerable? Why be optimistic? There is surging recognition of the problems, risk managers, governments, agencies, and so on. There's a greater move internationally to deal with ocean pollution and health. And you've heard some of that from Dr. Fleming. And I think that the science, but also global health objectives demand an attention. What can be done? You're gonna hear much more about this from Dr. Landrigan. And so I will leave that to him, but I am encouraged by global agreements that are on the horizon. And there will be a meeting of the conferences of the parties to three important conventions dealing with chemicals next July, and the theme of the meetings will focus on global agreements for a healthy planet, sound management of chemicals and waste. And with that, I thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and turn the microphone over to Dr. Landrigan. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you for that. And um, let me go forward and build off that message of optimism with which you concluded and talk about the fact that, in talking more detail to pick up on what John said about the fact that, that ocean pollution can be prevented. I think a, a lot of us on, on the call this afternoon are public health people of one brand or another. Prevention is, is our lifeblood. That's how I've approached this issue of ocean pollution from the beginning, thinking about how could we understand it and then turn that knowledge into preventive intervention. So let's begin with a quick definition of what is pollution. Uh, basically, I consider it to be waste material that is released into the environment by people 
So it's not natural seeps of oil. It's not volcanic emissions. Um, it's it's material that's, that's released intentionally or unintentionally by human activity, gets into the environment, and then causes damage either to human health or to ecosystems. You've already heard from Laura and John that ocean pollution is complex. It's it's worsening. Uh, that it poses a clear and present danger to human health and well-being. And an important takeaway from the perspective of pollution is that 80% of ocean pollution originates on land. And therefore, logically, the bulk of preventive efforts are going to have to be directed at terrestrial sources of ocean pollution. So what are the drivers? Why, why has ocean pollution gotten so bad in the last, in the last 50 years? Well, I think one big thing is that we have seen massive increases since really since World War II, but especially since the 1960s in the production of, of manufactured chemicals and pesticides. Uh, global pesticide production is doubling every 25 or 30 years. Another uh, important statistic here, not on the slide, is that close to 70% of chemical and pesticide production today takes place in low income and middle income countries, uh, something that has multiple implications for global health. Uh, it relates to occupational exposures of chemical workers and farmers in those countries, people that live near farms, farm families, and it also relates to uh, environmental pollution uh, in, in countries that often don't have a very strong OSHA, don't have a strong EPA. All you have to do is think back to the Bhopal disaster in India to um, think about the magnitude of the uh, crises that chemical production in developing countries can produce. At the same time as we've seen that increase in the production of manufactured chemicals of all kinds, we've seen a massive increase in the, in the production of plastics. This is actually accelerating at a faster rate than chemical production. And the biggest contributor to this recent acceleration is in single use plastics, the stuff you tear off a wrapper of some food product or something you buy at the hardware store and throw in the recycling. And some of that stuff gets recycled and gets appropriately dealt with, but too much of it does not. A lot of it gets into rivers and washes into the sea. Some of it goes directly into the oceans. And an estimated 10 to 12 million tons of plastic waste enters the, the oceans each year. And it's certainly not the only form of ocean pollution, as you already heard, but it's, it's the most visible component. And then finally, rapid development along the coast. More and more people worldwide are gravitating towards the seacoast for all kinds of reasons to, to uh, enjoy the benefits that Laura has enumerated. And something like 40% of the world's population now lives uh, either directly on or, or near seacoast, sea all of which increases the, the pressure on marine environments. So here's a couple of graphics to illustrate what I've just been saying. Here's the increase since 1987 in global chemical production. The blue part of the graph is the increase in actual production tonnage. And the green line above the blue is capacity. You can see that there's a certain amount of un unused capacity, which means that chemical production could increase still further in the years ahead, depending on markets and depending upon those extremely important international agreements that John Stegman just mentioned in his concluding slide. And here's the graph on plastic production, which you see got off, to, got off the ground more recently, but is now really escalating. Both of those graphics, by the way, uh, are found in our recent report, if you wanna look at them in more detail. So what were some of the key findings of our recently released uh, report of our Monaco Commission on Human Health and Pollution? Well, the first, is the pollution has multiple effects on marine ecosystems, on coral reefs, on estuaries, on mangrove forests, which are the, nurture, the nurseries of the sea. Lots of negative impacts on human health, and you've heard about those in detail from, from John. Uh, it's very unjust. Uh, ocean pollution is falls disproportionately heavily on the poor, the vulnerable minorities and indigenous people, groups that for the most part produce very little pollution themselves, but suffer disproportionately heavily from its consequences. Even though we know a lot about ocean pollution, we don't have anything like a complete map. We know much more, for example, about air pollution because we can 
map it by satellites. We know a bit more about plastic pollution in the oceans and other forms of pollution because you can also see uh, the great plastic gyres in the middle of the oceans from, from satellites. Uh, but everything that's beneath the surface is pretty much invisible, except right along the coastlines. And here's the, here's the real kicker. The, the most important takeaway from our uh, report, which was the fruit of two years effort, is that ocean pollution, like all forms of pollution, can be controlled and prevented. Prevention is very cost effective and it produces multiple benefits that can be felt immediately, but that last for long periods of time. And the, the playbook from which we derived that very powerful conclusion was the 2018 Lancet Commission on Pollution and Health, which looked at air, water, and land pollution, didn't really do very much with ocean pollution, which was one of the reasons we embarked on the, on the present project. But this Lancet Commission did give us a playbook and, and it provided the evidence that pollution can be prevented. And here's, here's the basic evidence. The, the fact that high income countries like the United States, Western Europe, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, others, uh, and some middle income countries, Mexico, Chile are, are good examples, have made excellent progress against air pollution and drinking water pollution. Um, and the way they've done it, there's no single solution. There's no one size fits all because obviously every country has a different government and a different legal structure. But the basic, the basic strategy begins with law, then come policy and technology that specify standards and, and, and lay out the details of how the pollution be, should be prevented. And then there's regulation that, that, that prioritizes the major sources goes after them and enforces it. And our commission concluded that these solutions have been so successful, the playbook has been so good that they're ready to be taken to global scale. So here's some examples. In the United States, we have reduced air pollution by 70%, 70 percent, seven zero percent since uh, we passed the, the Clean Air Act in 1970, which incidentally was signed into law by President Richard Nixon. And every dollar that we've invested in the control of air pollution has yielded $30 in benefits, which is really quite an amazing return on investment. Most of the gain has been on disease prevention. Likewise, the removal of lead from gasoline has basically ended airborne lead pollution in countries around the world. And it's returned billions of dollars to the economy because of the fact that when we took lead out of gasoline, the average IQ of American children jumped about five points. These more intelligent children are more creative, more economically productive across their lifetimes. And uh, economists have calculated that in just in the United States alone, just in one country, uh, the economic benefit of taking lead out of gasoline has been $200 billion in each annual crop of babies born since about 1980 really an astounding uh, economic return. Here's a graph to illustrate that. The lower most line on this graph, which I'm now indicating with my cursor, is the decline in air pollution in the United States from 1970 to 2017. And the upper line, the green line here that I'm touching with the cursor, that is the, uh, the GDP, the gross domestic product, uh, a measure of the economy of the country. And you can see the national economy of the United States grew by 250% in this same 50-year uh, time period in which air pollution fell by 70%. So anybody who tells you that controlling pollution is going to kill jobs, stifle the economy, is just not speaking truth, simply not borne out by the facts. There have been a number of successes in the control of ocean pollution, and we enumerate these in, in detail with case studies in our report, but just a few of the big ones. Um, Boston Harbor cleanup close to where I live. Um, in 1990, Boston Harbor was called the Harbor of Shame. It was, such a, it was such a blight on the environment that in the presidential campaign, when uh, the first George Bush ran against Michael Dukakis, who was then the governor of Massachusetts, uh, Bush hung the contamination of Boston Harbor around Dukakis's neck, and it was one of the factors that led to his defeat. 
Since that time, almost $5 billion has been put into cleaning up the harbor, and somewhere between $30 and $100 billion have been returned in the form of ecosystem services, tourism, uh, restored fisheries, oyster beds. It's really quite amazing. Hong Kong, Chesapeake Bay, reductions in persistent organic pollutants in Europe, a cleanup of algal blooms in the inland sea in Japan, control of plastic pollution in the Mediterranean, restoration of coral reefs in American Samoa are among, among some of the other examples. And as I, as I list here, these, uh, these successes have had multiple benefits, including very strong economic benefits. So we concluded the Monaco release event last week with a call for action uh, to end ocean pollution and protect human health and well-being. Prince Albert of Monaco was our sponsor throughout this work, throughout the two-year effort, and he, he got strongly behind this call for action, and uh, he's going to be working with us to uh, uh, encourage uh, other world leaders to, to endorse it and, and to take interventions against ocean pollution. It, it basically calls on leaders in every country and all citizens of the earth to safeguard human health, to preserve the planet that is our common home by ending pollution of the oceans. And here are some specific actions. These complement the specific actions that John Stegeman listed in his last slide. First of all, most fundamentally, we got to wean ourselves off fossil fuels and get to renewables, to, um, to wind and solar in, in particular. And it's feasible these days. Uh, the percentage of global electricity being generated by wind and solar has increased almost 500% in the past decade from less than 4% to more than 18%. It's an extraordinary increase in just 10 years. And at the same time, the cost of producing electricity from renewables has fallen dramatically. It's now 80% cheaper than it used to be to produce electricity from solar energy and 50% cheaper from wind energy. We need to stop mercury pollution in the oceans and recognize, as was said by, by John and Laura, that the principal source of mercury pollution in the oceans is coal. When all coal contains mercury. When coal is burned, mercury vaporizes, it goes up the stack, it travels through the atmosphere, it comes down into the oceans, it accumulates in fish, and then gets back into people when we eat uh, fish at the top of the food chain, like tuna, swordfish, striped bass, bluefish, whales. And if, though, if those fish are contaminated with mercury, uh, the mercury goes into people that eat the fish. Uh, in the case of pregnant women, it goes through into the bodies of their infants in the womb, causes brain injury, loss of IQ, behavioral problems, all tracing back to the combustion of coal. Plastic pollution of the oceans can be controlled by imposing a global ban on the production of single-use plastic. Uh, the state of New York, the Republic of Rwanda, the Republic of Kenya have all banned plastic bags. Those are all important first steps. They need to be extended to other products and to more countries. Recycling. Agricultural releases can be controlled along the, the coast. This requires going point by point, identifying the sources and going after them. Uh, it requires enforcement, it requires legislation, and of course, it requires political leadership. Monitoring is essential. Uh, marine pollution control programs need to be extended. Again, this comes back to the international agreements that John Stegeman mentioned a few moments ago. And of course, we need to support research. Finally, let us not forget the importance of marine protected areas, which I think of as the national parks of the ocean. These, are, these marine protected areas are extraordinary places. Um, when protection is properly enforced, there's no dredging, there's no undersea mining, there's no oil exploration, uh, vital habitats are protected, fisheries are restored, human health, human well being are increased. These are some of the specific steps we have to take. We call upon all world leaders to recognize the gravity of the problem of ocean pollution recognize that it's not just something that's invisible over the horizon and under the surface of the sea, but actually something that comes back and, and harms people. Thank you very much. And I remind us all that we are, 
the stewards of this earth, we hold it in trust for our children. I'm a pediatrician. I always feel obligated to, to mention that. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Landrigan, uh, Dr. Fleming, and Dr. Stegeman. Uh, those were outstanding presentations and gave us much food for thought. It's fantastic the way that, uh, Dr. Fleming, you've challenged us all to in global health to see the environment as part of human health, as, as you've all done and uh, given us paths forward, Dr. Stegeman and Dr. Landrigan, uh, and Dr. Landrigan for the future children. So uh, as we wait, we'll wait for some uh, questions. So everybody, everybody's on who's watching uh, the webinar, please send in your questions in the question box and we'll post the, pose them to our to our speakers. So I just want to start off though, and uh, Dr. Fleming, I'd like to start with you with the first question. And you said we've got to get people to care. So you gave some excellent examples of, of uh, programs that are working. What do we need to do in the global health community to get behind this work? What do we need to do to get people, both the scientific community and the public and policymakers to care? Um, I don't know that I have the answer to that entire question. Thank you, Dr. Martin, for this question. But I guess for me, there's several levels. I mean, I, I think I grew up in the 60s and the whole idea of think globally, act locally, I think is a major way forward. Many of the examples that I gave and others that are raised, for example, in the document that Phil has just talked about, is about local communities working with experts and NGOs and industry to clean up local areas and then sharing that information across either through scientific channels, but also through other channels. And then using those experiences, that evidence to force policymakers locally, regionally, and ideally nationally and globally to do something about it. I think one issue that I will flag that has come up in our research, um, both in Europe and elsewhere, is that in general, environmental policy goes across national borders, but health policy tends to be very focused in the national or even local and regional borders. And I think there's a huge work, piece of work for the global health community to start tying in policy globally that includes both the health of the environment and the health of people. No, ab absolutely, and we certainly have to take that interdisciplinary, integrated, intersectoral approach to do that for the win-win uh, uh, opportunities that you've all described. Uh, Dr. Stegman, this question has come in and has to do with microplastics. And the questioner wants to know, um, plastics that are in fish when they're used fish is being used for animal feed do we see bioaccumulation of microplastics through the food chain from the fish we're feeding to animals and the animals we're eating yeah i think the short answer is uh, probably yes uh, there are people who have been studying this and it is a concern and one of the uh, important aspects of this is to is if there is such um, bioaccumulation, then plastics could become a target for inclusion in the in the restrictions as part of the Stockholm Convention. And I think that it will be uh, important to put that possibility before the convention. Uh, but that kind of information uh, that you've asked about is very important for that listing. Um, this is an area of active research. Um, effects, transfer, uh, persistence, um, stability and degeneration of plastics in the ocean uh, and how they move through the food chain. Um, stay tuned. Fantastic. Well, uh, I'm glad that you all brought up the issue. And, and, I, I, and Dr. Landry, I'm going to segue off Dr. Stegeman's comments about plastics because it has received understandably so much attention. If we're looking at getting rid of single-use plastics, do you have any uh, thoughts or ideas about what we can do to what, what materials are out there to be able to, to use not plastic but biodegradable material? Is there any, uh, any uh, 
guidance or information you can give to our viewers about what biodegradable materials could governments incentivize the private sector to use that would wean us off plastic? Yeah, um, there's clearly no no single solution because it, it's a complex issue. But if if we all think back 10 or 15 years, to be sure, we we had plastic at that time, but we didn't we, we weren't surrounded by it the the way we are today. We the, the 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 number of uses of plastic, the multiple layers of plastic packaging that have proliferated in the past decade are, are just extraordinary. I mean, try going to uh, the hardware store and buying a box of screws, you've got to cut through about three layers of heavy duty plastic with a sharp knife before you can get to the stuff you bought. And a lot of that reflects very deliberate, very smart uh, marketing and distribution by the by the plastic industry who have their, uh, they have found more and more uses for their product. They have been, they have been pushing them aggressively. Part of what's going on behind the scenes here is that the fossil fuel industry has come to realize that over the next couple of decades, their traditional markets are drying up. People are switching to electric cars, people are driving less, so they're selling less gasoline. More and more people are heating and cooling their homes with, with wind and solar power, not with fossil fuels. And the fossil fuel industry has figured out that they can, use their carbon uh, fuels as the fundamental feedstocks for, for making plastic. Uh, the European Greens and others are now referring to plastics as the fossil fuel industry's plan B. And they're, what they do is they bring uh, natural gas out of the ground, which of course is mostly methane. A lot of that natural gas goes into catalytic crackers, which change the methane to ethane. Which is the which is a fundamental building block of, of multiple plastics, and a lot of the plastic, uh, sorry, a lot of the natural gas that's now being pumped around the country in pipelines and compressor stations is not intended to heat homes at all, but rather is is feedstock for the for the plastic industry. So there are some very powerful forces who are deliberately at work here trying to uh, increase our dependence on plastic. So to come to your question, how do we how do we fight that? I think. First, recognize the problem. I, I think it's, it's crept up on us. Uh, most of us haven't recognized the magnitude of it or the consequences. Remember how we used to shop, paper bags, glass bottles. Uh, those products are still available. I still get my spaghetti sauce in glass bottles. Um, uh, there's, um, uh, there's no reason that we couldn't go back a bit in time to, uh, to better packaging materials. Uh, legislation and regulation are clearly going to be necessary. Things like banning single-use plastic bags. Who the hell needs a, a single-use plastic bag? It's just a completely unnecessary piece of work. And uh, if stores require people to bring cloth bags, if they charge people a dollar for each plastic bag that they get, that very quickly changes behavior. No, indeed, and I think what was uh, you know, powerful in all of your messages is as we the, the grill in the, at, the, at the table is climate change, but you've all articulated that moving to, uh, to renewables is good for health, good for the environment, good for economies. And I didn't, I wasn't fully aware of it. Well, I think the point you made, Dr. Landrigan, about that coal is the greatest source of mercury is a powerful, powerful, uh, a powerful statement. Um, Dr. Fleming, you know, you're, situ you, you're where you are normally without COVID is in Exeter in the United Kingdom. Can you share with us uh, information with regard to harmful algal blooms and what you see are the priority actions that should be taken to be able to reduce those algal blooms that Dr. Stegeman mentioned in his talk? Huh. <laughs> I actually have not done as much work in the last 10 years around harmful algal blooms as I did before when I was one of the few physician epidemiologists involved in harmful algal bloom research. And I will ask John and Phil to fill in any gaps um, I think one big issue for me, and it continues to be an issue, is there is relatively good monitoring, environmental monitoring of harmful algal blooms. It varies by country, and some of it is actually in the water, and some of it is in the food that is taken from those waters. Ideally, it's in the water before it gets in the food. Um, but actually, the monitoring from the human health point of view is still pretty bad. There's one excellent system from the US CDC 
called Habith, which was set up by Dr. Lori Baker and her colleagues. And that system tries to collect data both from the environmental impacts, the harmful algal bloom counts, et cetera, impacts on other animals, for example, marine mammals, and on humans. But otherwise, there's not much out there. So when my colleagues in the HAB community, who are marine scientists, say, HABs are increasing, I can't say yes or no whether harmful algal bloom diseases in humans are increasing because I don't have good data to be able to say that and I don't have good monitoring systems. So if I were had a wish list, I would that would be one of the things that I would wish for. I think there is a lot of work going on in freshwater harmful blooms, um, the so-called cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, and for a lot of reasons, that probably is going to be where these systems pay off more and where we have more information connecting up the human health and uh, the environmental exposures because they're limited systems. But I'll be interested to see if John and Phil have anything to add to that. Thanks, Dr. Swim. Dr. Segerman. Yeah, so the, uh, the issues really are prevention and mitigation. Um, and prevention is, is going to be achieved by adequate monitoring and not only monitoring, but prediction. And so the efforts among the HAB community now are really directed at being able to predict when a bloom is gonna be severe. Uh, and actually the, the results are coming astonishingly close to being able to do that um, for some, but not for all. Uh, the other is mitigation. So um, how you prevent exposures, one by predicting and closing uh, harvesting of shellfish, for example, so that people aren't exposed. And the other is getting rid of a bloom when it, when it occurs. And there are efforts in that direction. And one of the ways that people have been trying to do it is with clays that will sorb the harmful algal species and bring them down to the bottom and prevent their spread and prevent their uh, contaminating of shellfish. Um, but Laura's exactly right. We don't know what the health consequences are and the connection between HAB blooms and, and the health impacts is still not as good as it could be. One of the areas where we are missing information is the effects that may occur as a result of exposure to levels of HAB toxin below the levels at which action is taken to close shellfish harvesting, for example. So if you live in an area where HABs are common, where they occur frequently and every year, it's a year, year, year situation, there will be periods when harvesting of shellfish is certainly allowed, but it's almost certain that there will be low levels of toxin in those shellfish. And what those low levels are capable of doing, we do not know. And so that's one of the objectives that we have in our center is to identify what those low level effects might be and particularly during developmental stages. And that's how the effects on uh, defects in myelination, coating the nerves that helps their transmission uh, was discovered and uh, recently published in Environmental Health Perspective. So there are in interesting questions as far as both monitoring, prediction, and mitigation. Laura's very right, though, that the freshwater cyanobacteria blooms are very important for health, um, health effects in drinking water, um, bathing, uh, your dog swimming in cyanobacterial uh, bloomed ponds. Um, there are serious issues with the freshwater HABs. And the two are coming together, by the way, freshwater and uh, marine in uh, recent discussions that are occurring and hopefully resulting in publications. Well, I wanted to, on, on you know, you described, uh, Dr. Stegman, the 350,000 known chemicals and the thousand you know, are being produced every year. And in the report that Dr. Landrigan helped to lead, he was very clear, Dr. Landrigan, about the numbers of pollution, uh, uh, chemicals are producing the interactions which we don't know much about. So I wanted to ask you because there's a seminal point in the in the declaration, the Monaco Declaration. It's got to do with marine protected areas. I know when President Obama was in power, he made incredible strides expanding marine protected areas in the Pacific. My Prime Minister, Prime Minister Trudeau, did the same thing very recently, uh, expanding our marine protected areas. Can you? 
describe for the audience the power and importance, expand on what you said, the power of importance about marine protected areas as a source of healing the ocean, but also the co-benefits that derive from it for people. Sure, well, I think the way to think about marine protected areas is to think about Yosemite, or if you're Canadian, think about Banff and Lake Louise. Um, think of pristine areas of extraordinary natural beauty that convey a whole a whole suite of, of benefits to humans. There, there's benefits for health because when we have access to natural parks, we can exercise and improve our cardiovascular system. There are positive impacts on our well-being. Uh, you, your mind is refreshed, your spirit is lifted when you visit a place like that. Marine protected areas, of course, are beneath the surface of the water, so they don't hit you in the face the same way Yosemite does. But but they too are areas of extraordinary beauty, places of great natural richness beneath the sea, vital habitats that serve as fish nurseries. That uh, therefore, uh, when when we protect areas of the sea, uh, we allow fish stocks to recover, as we, as is happening in parts of the North Atlantic, the George Bank. Uh, human health benefits directly and indirectly, human well-being is increased. Uh, and, and because these parks, at least in theory, are uh, protected in perpetuity, the, the benefits are lasting. It becomes the gift that keeps giving. I know Laura has thought a lot about this, and I think she wants to add something. <laughs> I also think... Go ahead. You get the last word you. before we go into thank reverse you. for closing um, comments. I think... We also should look at, there's a particular group of marine protected areas that have been um, gathered together by UNESCO. And one of the interesting pieces of that is that it actually includes people who are living in and around these marine protected areas. So you have the one extreme, which is the highly protected one that Phil has just described, and I think we need those. But we also need to look at how can we live sustainably and good for our own health as well as the local environment in a protected scenario. So it would not have quite the amount, same protection that Phil just described, a la Yosemite, but it allows the local people to continue to live the way they do. Also things like ecotourism, to the extent that that can be a useful um, source of income. I think that also is another model for marine protected areas that we need to explore in the future. No, thank you very much. And that, and we've seen that happening. The we in conservation, whether it's terrestrial or marine, bringing the people in with the environment and the communities is the best way to move forward to get buy-in to be able to protect the environment and people's well-being. And it's it's clearly a win-win-win situation. Um, so we're close to the end. I just want to reverse and see if there are any uh, closing comments uh, by any of our wonderful presenters. Dr. Landrigan, I'll start with you. Dr. Stegeman and Dr. Fleming, you'll have the last word. Dr. Landrigan. Well, I'll just close with one word, optimism. Ocean pollution can be prevented. We know how to do it. The issue now is to mobilize a combination of popular demand and political will. Thank you, Dr. Landrigan. Dr. Stegeman. Right. Uh, last week was the Monaco meeting, which was very important, and the release of the report in the Annals of Global Health on ocean pollution and human health occurred on December 3rd. December 2nd, there was release of a report from the High Level pa Ocean Panel, which was a consortium of uh, uh, many countries, and they have published, which appeared in Nature, um, a, a very important report summarizing a case for action regarding the oceans. And I think that the coincident release of those two reports should spur attention and action, and I'm hoping that it will. But I agree with Phil that, that uh, optimism, I think, is the word of the day. I'm very optimistic with the efforts in the UN and all of the efforts that one sees in every quarter of the world that attention is focusing on the oceans which must result in action thank you dr stegman and dr fleming thank you and as a physician and epidemiologist who spent 30 years working around ocean and human health my plea is to my colleagues in public health and in all the healthcare specialties to come join us in this 
your expertise, your reputations, your credibility in your communities can make a huge difference going forward. And I agree with the optimism. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Fleming. Uh, so what a wonderful presentation. I'd very much like to thank Dr. Laura Fleming, Dr. John Stegeman, and Dr. Phil Landrigan for their incredible presentations. These presentations in this webinar will be on CUGH's website at cugh.org. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Um, I'd like to thank Jenna Smith, who does a wonderful job in our office uh, producing these webinars. Uh, you can come to our conference, which will be a virtual one next March, March 12th to the 14th, where you'll hear more about uh, this particular challenge on saving our oceans. If you want to know more about it, please take a look at the Annals of Global Health. It's online and free to access, where you can get the full report that uh, all of our speakers were talking about. And finally, just to encapsulate, 70% of the planet uh, are the oceans. Uh, as the oceans go, so too do we. So it's up to all of us, all of us, to be able to implement what we know in our own lives, take action individually, put pressure on policymakers, and act collectively to be able to save our oceans, because in saving our oceans, we save ourselves. Thank you very much for attending uh, today's webinar. I'm Dr. Keith Martin, the Executive Director of CUGH. We hope you have a wonderful day. Bye for now. Thank you. Thank you.